Sean, at the 601, it was Michael Thomas. Thomas did spend pretty much all of last season uh, out for the Saints. Was injured quite a bit the season before as well. So he's coming back in. He's obviously lost value in terms of ADP from his peak a couple of seasons ago when he had such monstrous campaigns and back-to-back seasons. And then went Hunter Renfro, Michael Carter, the Jets coming off the board at the 603. Gabriel Davis, who is flying up those draft boards at the moment. You did touch on that on the show earlier this week. The person who did draft Gabriel Davis did take Dawson Knox and Jar- Josh Allen as well. Then we get some quarterbacks and Joe Burrow, Kyler Murray. And then we do have Tyler Lockett, Dak Prescott going off the board. And that early portion of the sixth round, that's followed up by Branton Cooks, Branton Ayuk. We then took the rookie and Traylon Burks and then Leonard Fournette with the last pick off the sixth round. Sean, going through those picks there, I mentioned the Gabriel Davis when you touched a little bit on it on the one through five round show but we do have michael thomas you know if he is healthy and if he's injury free there's still those quarterback concerns in new orleans or is he with the saints what happens there it's going to be interesting to see how do you feel about some of those guys is there anyone standing out the, the quarterbacks feel like that's a fair range for those three guys to be going and borrow murray and prescott the picks that feel a little bit early for me there are the pick of gabriel davis and uh Probably just Gabriel Davis. I think the rest of that round ADP will shake out in that range. It's interesting, especially from a best ball perspective. One of the things that we do know is that a lot of the tweaks that people make for best ball don't actually work. We're overconfident in believing that there are going to be these differences that are predictable as opposed to just differences that we see in retrospect. But I do think that Davis could be a very high touchdown type of player. And you might be more excited about that in a format where you don't have to pick your starting lineup every week. It's an interesting contrast when you see these wide receivers, right? Because you have the established veterans coming off of solid years and Tyler Lockett and Brandon Cooks. And in some ways it's surprising that they would fall to 30 and 31. Cooks has already overcome bad quarterback play and so he's almost setting a floor right there at the same time we wouldn't have been that interested in him and that's I think kind of the dynamic that a lot of other drafters have where you're maybe looking for more excitement more upside right there there's also the concern even though he's played healthy for a while now he did go through that stretch with the concussions and so you have a little bit of a question mark in terms of you know what would happen if he takes a bad hit and hopefully just you know most importantly for uh, his own health and you know future life that he doesn't have one of those you have michael thomas who's drafted at the beginning of that round who is even much more of an injury red flag and now that it looks like the saints are you know taking steps to keep him there and be a part of their offense for 2022 i like him a lot less if he's going to be with the saints because i think that passing offense is going to be extremely poor and so lockett cooks those guys look like the real values hunter renfro you know <laughs> Ben and I uh, somewhat inadvertently, but in a way that we're excited about, got him in one of our dynasty trades. And he has that sort of Julian Edelman, Wes Welker type of upside now that he's established the rapport with Derek Carr. Derek Carr, I think, always underrated, at least for the last three or four years now. And you have Josh McDaniels there to where they could really, I think, now exaggerate even the amount of usage and the target rate that he gets so those all interesting picks then we kind of get toward the end of the round where you have brandon Ayuk, who's hoping to have a bounce back season and we selected Traylon burks who is a rookie with this extremely wide range of outcomes now it's wide receiver 33 and the players drafted in the last couple rounds i think even going all the way back to round four are not that exciting at wide receiver and so could burks beat a lot of them he could At the same time, you know, we're already sort of drafting him to where maybe there isn't a ton of upside at that price. So that's something that we have to take into consideration as well as we're building it. One of the things here is that even though there are a couple of, I would say, very good value picks in Lockett and Cooks, it's surprising to see the wide receivers in this round compared to the running backs in the next round. You have Rashad Penny, Devin Singletary, Clyde edwards Lair, and Isaiah Spiller in round seven and i mean those guys are going to rise up above these wide receivers right now is there potential for some of them to get hit and is that why they're in round seven yeah i mean the chiefs could always add more serious competition to edwards allaire or even have this situation where Jarrett mckinnon resigns which is something i've been projecting the whole way and you know i think mckinnon should probably be going earlier in drafts as well even even if mckinnon comes back you would expect them to give Edwards Alaire, one more real shot at it. Devin Singletary, unless they add a real star, 
I mean, it's absurd for him to be in round seven. Rashad Penny, you know, you have some of these quotes that have come out where, you know, he could go back to Seattle as the backup to Chris Carson. We passed on Chris Carson at the 1411, and then he did go one pick later. But I would think that the fantasy community is all over this. And that, I mean, Rashad Penny is not going to be the backup to Chris Carson, but also I don't think he's going to be the backup in any team that would sign him away from the Seahawks. And so, you know, could he get hurt, you know, sitting on his couch watching TV? Could he get hurt, you know, in the first practice for his new team? You know, could he get hurt in the first game? Do we still have those injury concerns? Probably, but yet at the same time, it's very clear now that he's probably a top 10 running back in terms of pure talent. And if you then move to a team that's paid you to be a starter, I mean, round seven here feels uh, kind of absurd, right? And so, again, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to take the wide receivers early. And it's also one of the reasons why, you know, maybe our pick of Kadarius Tony in round seven doesn't make sense or doesn't fit with what we wanted to do. Now, we were able to get ETN and Hall in rounds four and five for anybody who missed the previous episode. So we have some running backs there. We wanted to get back to wide receiver. Maybe it's the Burks pick. I was excited about Burks because a lot of the drafts that I've done so far, he went in the fifth round. And so at the end of six, you're like, okay, well, that's a, a deal right now. And if he solidifies himself as the top wide receiver in the draft, if he goes in the top 10 picks, then suddenly we're looking at a price that's higher. So we want to get maybe one share right there. Even with that being the case, you know, maybe that selection is the one that doesn't really work because then after we pick in round seven, right, and those running backs go in round seven, by the time it gets back to us, Miles Sanders, Damian Harris, and Kareem Hunt have come off the board. And so we're looking at something of a tier break, even though I think you and I have James Conner still in that group and we could have selected him. But then the issue for us is that. We need a QB and a really good one fell beyond where he should have in Jalen Hurts. And then because we missed on the tight end early, we need a tight end and we really like Noah Fant there. So then we don't take James Conner either. That means we didn't exactly execute this element where we were going to take advantage of the running back value. But Colin, coming back to this look at six through 10, big picture wise, where do you like these running backs and where do you see the tier breaks? One of the things that's interesting to me is that even though you and I are very high on A.J. Diller, Dillon and Tony Pollard, I'm surprised to see those backs and then Damian Harris, who went in round eight. I mean, Dillon and Pollard are backups. And Harris is in a situation where it's probably going to be a full-blown committee this next year. Ramondre Stevenson goes in round 10, so not that far behind him. And Stevenson, probably the better receiving backs. We have this dynamic in these rounds where potentially high upside starters and then pure committee backs or backups are actually going pretty close to each other. And so being able to navigate those tier breaks at running back, I think is a huge part of drafting early. Yeah, no, I would agree. And, you know, when we look at where they're going, you mentioned a, a kind of a, a tier break. And I do think when you get to Singletary, some people might have Edwards Alaire in that mix. Some people might even have Isaiah Speller in it. But when we took in the fourth and fifth round recap and kind of the last episode we took etn and hall looking back i'm happy with how the draft played out but i think if maybe we bypass those guys i think then we are in the the stakes to get penny and singletary in the you know that six and seven turn I, I really do agree with what you're saying then like after those two guys and even after edwards Alaire, you're getting into a situation where we're looking at guys who are backups so you know, last year we're looking at those zero RB candidates. They're going in the ninth, tenth round. These guys are also going in the ninth and tenth round. But what I think is happening is people are getting more aware of the dead zone. They're looking into some of these profiles. And I, I mentioned on the show yesterday that it's not as action packed with those green picks in terms of the running back position in that six through ten range, which I think is is showing that drafters with the content that's out there are continuing to get smarter and smarter with their strategies so i think once we get to singletary and you mentioned penny and singletary if penny ends up back in seattle i think he has to be the starter i think then obviously if he ends up somewhere else somebody's going to be paying him more than the seahawks which likely means he's also going to be the starter there i think singletary is probably the most interesting running back in terms of adp at the moment if they do not address that with somebody of relatively decent capital 
Singletary is going to be the starting running back and one of the best offenses in the NFL. So I think him going in the mid seventh round at the moment feels like a, a real value pick. And I think if we hadn't have had two running backs in the fourth and fifth round, I think either in the sixth or seventh round, I think he would have been a priority target. Would you agree with that, that you know, you'd be pushing him into you know, say the 702 at that point if we hadn't, if we had another wide receiver and, and one less running back come that pick? Yeah, and, and the issue there, what's it at the 4-5 where we really like Etienne and Hall? I, I mean, there's just no wide receiver value. It's not that you're not going to be able to draft some people who are interesting. I mean, the guys we drafted in 6 and 7, we like. So it's not like the wide receivers are completely gone. But I think the big key would have been if uh, for people who did listen into the draft, Hawkinson was our target, our, our dream target at the uh, the 4 the 11 sorry, and he went one pick before. So I think if we take Hawkinson there over etn i think then maybe we take hall or etn and the the 502 i think then you know we'll have one running back at that point and i think that puts singletary uh, and penny both into frame and i think that probably would have been beneficial to us then for the spot where we had to go fant and smith in the ninth and 11th rounds uh, in terms of the overall structure but you know <laughs> you can't get the dream scenario in all cases so we missed out in hawkinson and then we we went with what we went with at that point yeah, and Hawkinson shouldn't have come back to the 410. I think that is a little bit silly in terms of evaluation. So uh, it would have been amazing if it had happened. Definitely not one that I felt like was likely. I mean, Dobbins and Hawkinson, the two guys we wanted, and yet they should have gone so much earlier that I felt it was a virtual guarantee that they would go in those two picks right before us. One of the things that I think it's it's worth talking about here, Colin, and I mentioned you know drafting in reverse in the open and then – looking a little bit at construction is one of the reasons why occasionally people pass on those tight ends early. It's like, well, the opportunity cost is so significant, right? It's like, I know that the elite tight ends, especially if you get the one who doesn't get hurt and the one who scores the most points. I mean, that's obvious, but it's still worth noting. If you get the right guy, then you're in that group of teams that is winning across all of the leagues. And yet at the same time, you know, a Saquon Barkley goes after those top five tight ends and you know perhaps he would prefer you know even had to have Barkley straight up because he still has massive upside if we were to stay healthy and now it looks like the Giants may run a real NFL offense you have Alvin Kamara after those guys so the cost is significant and you can understand why that would be a concern for people but one of the problems then is that the cost of kind of rectifying the mistake, if you want to call it a mistake, or just the cost of taking a tight end later is also significant. And that's one of the things that we ran into here is that by taking the QB and the tight end, and again, it's like you could just continue passing on QB. And that's one of the things that we talked about in our strategy sessions for the draft was like, what if we just kind of go against what we know <laughs> the roster construction explorers tell us and experiment a little bit and take some of these late quarterbacks because it's so early and you know maybe we hit on somebody who rises into the qb window because by the time it's all said and done the new information that we have puts him in that group it's so early maybe we get lucky you know you have those extra round 19 round 20 picks you can add an extra guy there who's a rookie you can do all of that but the fact of the matter is that you're still much more likely to win if you simply draft the guys in the areas that gives you this prohibitive advantage every season so when Jalen Hurts falls there you know and then we have to take bit like I was saying those two picks you have to take them and then you can't take that other value and I think that sometimes people will miss out on the fact that wherever you take your tight end you're going to be sacrificing an important player at a different position you might as well make that sacrifice up at the top where history tells us it will allow you to win your league and so we like Noah Fant, and maybe he will actually be the league winner. Maybe the Broncos will get somebody in there. You know, in the dream scenario, you know, Albert O is maybe part of the package who moves out, and then you have more routes, you have more targets, and Fant makes the jump into that Waller Kittle kind of range. Then you're like, oh well, you know, it worked perfectly. But again, the key to working through this in your mind right now, when you don't know the future, is simply that by making that pick, you can't pick a Drake London, you can't pick a Garrett Wilson, and you can't take advantage of this great value in James Conner. I mean, right now, it looks like James Conner may be signed back to be the starting running back for the Arizona Cardinals, in which he's probably a fourth round value. And he goes at the 903, right? I mean, James Conner is back there with Eno Benjamin, and that is the running back group at Arizona 
then, I mean, you're talking about a third round pick. And because, you know, we took Fant instead, you can't make that selection. So again, working out who you're going to miss on and how much that costs you in terms of what your board is and what you see as the scenarios that could lead to these league winning outcomes. You want to have that front and center in your mind when you're making those decisions early on. Yeah, you definitely do. And uh, looking through the the rest of that, and you know, James Conner, we'll touch probably on him in a moment when we get into the ninth round again, but he he was well and truly my guy last year. Um, At one point I started to, you know, worry, um, you know, a week before the season, I'm like, I have drafted James Conner too many times, but it, it did work out as the season went along. So moving on into the eighth round to look through how some of these plays picked out the last pick of the the seventh round was matthew stafford the matthew stafford drafter also took Aaron Rodgers. then we get into tight end with dalton schultz we have miles sanders justin fields alan robinson mike gasecki damian harris who you touched on there rashad bitman adam thielen kareem hunt then we took jalen hurts at the second last pick in the eighth round then robert woods so in this round we have three quarterbacks we have two tight ends uh, we have three running backs and then the rest at wide receiver Feels like in this tier, Sean, we really get into the the veteran wide receiver options. Kind of, it's that tier of you know the veterans who maybe are dropping off with injuries and age. You know, maybe they still can produce for another season. Then we have Rashad Bateman who's heading into his second year. A couple of of, of wide receiver or running back, sorry, and then the the quarterbacks who I mentioned. I think in this round, the two players that I would be you know targeting um, with the most priority i think for me I, I this feels to me like a quarterback tier if i'm not going for Bitman at wide receiver i think i'm looking at, at fields or hurts how are you seeing round eight at the moment as, as things are starting to play out here yeah the tight ends start to get pretty interesting here and our buddy todd who had a pick in the middle i was chatting with him a little bit and telling him uh that a little bit of a, a spoiler for people who haven't listened to the full draft we were hoping to get malik willis they're around 18 and he took him and he was saying he thought maybe if he had got us with Mike Kosicki as well, because he knows that is a per- a personal favorite of ours. And I think that however it works out, whether the Dolphins decide to use the franchise tag on Gasicki, whether they work out a contract or if he goes somewhere else, I mean, he's basically just a big receiver, right? He's not going to be used as a blocker. So his snap count isn't going to be particularly high compared to a lot of tight ends, but his route numbers and then, the targets that he draws on those routes, I think, could continue to increase. Last season was both another solid campaign from Gesicki and a little bit disappointing. I think that he has a secondary breakout in store. And so round eight, a good value for him there, especially when you then look at some of the other players that go. Because I mentioned just at such length this idea with Connor. I guess I don't think that most of the players actually drafted in round eight are that big of a cost, right? Or someone where if you had to pass on them, you would be that disappointed. The probable exception would be Justin Fields. I think that he and Hertz, the quarterback that we took, those guys are good value. So come on, looking again sort of positionally here and where the tier breaks are, one of the things that we saw is that the, the top four quarterbacks, if you include Herbert in that group, do go in the first five rounds. That's above where we're probably going to take them in any drafts. Although there is a possibility that at some point ADP settles such that it's so flat there and we're so feel so good about our picks in round six and seven that maybe if there's a Lamar Jackson there like he was in this draft you go ahead and take him but the QBs are interesting in that round six as you mentioned earlier is Burrow Murray and Prescott round seven is Lance and Stafford round eight Rogers Fields and Hertz and then round nine Russell Wilson I think there's a big tear break after that before we get to Kirk Cousins, Derek Carr and Deshaun Watson and like I said I'm a big Carr fan his path to scoring fantasy points is a little bit trickier they need to add weapons he's not going to add it with the legs Cousins a similar situation where his coaching context gets better but you know a lot of what he has done through the years is be able to win Minnesota then gets in a bad game script. You know, you put on that flurry of points at the end. If they are more efficient and they win some of these games, I think a little bit of that balances out. And then again, he's not going to give you the value with his legs. And so I prefer to have a player, especially like Cousins, where I think that he's well down from Carr in terms of how the two guys are playing right now. Some of that is covered up, I think, because their weapons are so different. 
I mean, if you have Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen, it, it's going to be very hard for Derek Carr to show how big of a gap there is. You know, if they can close that talent gap a little bit, I think that you'll see Derek Carr do a little bit what he was doing in the first half of last season, where for quite a while he was leading the NFL in passing yards. Obviously, they need to score some passing touchdowns. Maybe you can take advantage of Derek Carr with a touchdown rate bouncing back. But again, you know, what price are you willing to pay for that? I think that once you get into that round 10 range, you know, you've got to look toward the end of that tier with some of these guys like a Daniel Jones, who maybe has more of a hybrid profile and could be a legitimate outperform bounce back kind of guy as well. But so if we think that there's a tier break after Russell Wilson in the middle of round nine, how do you like the way that those guys play out ahead of that? One of the things here, and I love Joe Burrow and, and Burrow could be someone, you know, I don't necessarily think that it's justified to have a big gap between Herbert and Burrow. And you know, at the same time, I wonder about Burrow and Prescott in this same kind of price area with Murray. And one of the things I mentioned in the QB tiers that I published recently, and one of the things that Ben did a great job of explaining on Stealing Fan is, is that Prescott is not a hybrid QB, right? And so you're not going to get that rushing value for him. He's got to do it through the air. Joe Burrow, you know, again, mostly has to do it through the air. Kyler Murray, before he suffered the injuries the last couple of years, has really been up there with Allen and Mahomes. And so how much do you think it's all of this scuttlebutt coming out of Arizona where, you know, he's being portrayed as a, a selfish, immature, you know, kind of a bad dude who also is at odds with the organization, which we know is never good. And how much of it is an element where people are looking at the second half of last season and saying, you know, if he's remotely injured, you know, if he has, you know, a tweak and is playing with some kind of nagging injury, he's just simply not the same guy. And a guy who scrambles a lot and is that little is likely going to be playing with those things. I, I guess for me, the answer is that I think I'm going to have a lot of Murray if he's going to be priced in this tier that he, you know, I don't think that his actual scoring profile belongs in. And yet at the same time, I can understand the concerns that drafters have. Yeah, I, I would agree kind of with what you're leaning on there. I think like the clear top three are uh, Allen, Mahomes and Herbert. But I, I do think that Murray and Jackson, who we talked about in that QB tier show, are in that next slot. And you know, in this particular draft, there's almost a round of a discount between where Jackson goes and Murray goes. And you mentioned the, the Russian upside. I think part of the narrative around Murray is the off the field stuff that's going on at the moment. Part of it is the injuries, which you mentioned, but there is obviously the the scenario where Kyler Murray, probably from like you know his rookie season to second season and so on, hasn't actually probably improved that much as a quarterback. But he falls into that bracket where Cam Newton was for many years, where he is such a good rusher, um, scores rushing touchdowns, has the ability to kind of take it the whole distance from from anywhere on the field. I think that that leads to him been maybe overlooked a bit here so he, in terms of being a quarterback we do see him have some poor plays but then when we look at it from the kind of rushing ability i think that's what's probably letting him slip down here but i think the off the field stuff is is hurting him as well but i, I would definitely be prioritizing as much as i love joe burrow i would be still prioritizing murray ahead of him this year it feels like the way that to win in the, the quarterback drafting is with those Russian quarterbacks like Murray, who you're getting a discount on, like Jackson, who you're getting a discount from, Allen uh, and Herbert even. But then we look at Jalen Hurts and Justin Fields. I think that's what separates them out when you're looking at the other guys going in that range. It's Matthew Stafford, it's Aaron Rodgers. Um, you know, I, I think you're getting that edge with the, the Russian ability. Um, even those quarterbacks may have some issues as actual NFL quarterbacks. I think they're still, you know, very, very strong fantasy options the other thing i would say there when we're looking through the players going like you mentioned karen cousins going in the 10th Deshaun watson went in the 10th when we're looking at the quarterback window i think you know hurts and fields you want to get one of those guys i think then if you can get car cousins or ryan Tannehill, for example as your second option at the quarterback position i think that's a, a better way to build out those kind of quarterback rooms uh, in this one. Tannehill did go in the 11th round. Sean, as we get ready to, to start to wrap up some of the tiers, I'm going to go a little bit of rapid fire through round 9 and 10. We have touched on a number of the players already, but we will let you pick out some of the guys that you want to really hit on. So we have AJ Dillon at the 901, then Noah Fant, 
then James Conner, Drake London, the rookie, then we have Russell Wilson, Cole Komet, Tony Pollard, Garrett Wilson, uh, Zach Ertz, Hunter Henry, Carter L. Patterson, Tyler Higby, and then round 10 is rounded out from the 10 one with Kenneth Walker, Rondell Moore, Juju Smith-Schuster, Logan Thomas, Ramondre Stevenson, the quarterbacks then, and Kirk Cousins, Derek Carr, Deshaun Watson, Alexander Madison, and then some wide receivers uh, in Kenny Galladay, Cortland Sutton, and Tyler Boyd. So looking at that, you and Ben had a really fascinating discussion around Rondell Moore on Stadium Bananas this week. Really enjoyed that one. Uh, you did talk as well a couple of weeks ago about Juju Smith-Schuster and his potential to maybe bounce back. Um, what's your thoughts on those ninth and 10th round guys, maybe hitting on some of the, the guys that we haven't touched on in today's show? Yeah, I, I love these rookie wide receivers here. And I think that they're going to rise into the seventh round range, maybe even a little bit higher because it's going to be easy to look at those players and dream of a Jalen Waddle type of return. And we know that in the seventh round range last season, you know, he paid off handsomely and not every rookie wide receiver drafted in that range is, is going to do that. But there are reasons to believe that Wilson and London are very good prospects that they'll go into a range in the reality draft that gives them a high floor, but also perhaps go to some teams that do have some pieces in place. So you're not you know, you're not going to one of these teams that is starting completely from scratch. I mean, that's one of the things that really happened last year with Chase and Waddle is that even though they were drafted very early, the Bengals and the Dolphins were teams that we're ready to take that next step to be playoff contenders. Obviously the Bengals go for the Super Bowl and the Dolphins, you know, don't quite make the playoffs and get embroiled in all the controversy. But the fact of the matter was they had some pieces in place there with the young quarterbacks to where they would allow them to do that. I'm optimistic at this point that there's probably more upside than downside to not just what you're going to get if you draft them at these prices, but you're also going to see the prices actually go up. And so you benefit a little bit from that in terms of building out your portfolio. Again, that situation where, you know, if you don't have to take Noah Fant, then you can get one of those two guys and feel very good about it. I don't know that the, uh, the thing that's interesting here, and, you know, we're, we're going through six through 10, but there's a, another big tier break at the end of round 10. So you mentioned Rondell Moore. He was never really a consideration for this team for us based on what we were doing. We were out of position to get him because I think you would like to get him in the early 10 or even the late 10. And obviously we were drafting early in nine, late in 10. He didn't make it that far. Uh, Kenny Galladay, one pick ahead of us. He's a very controversial player, but an interesting player. We wouldn't have picked him with already having Kadarius Tony, but... I think someone who could end up being a value if he can simply stay healthy. But then we picked Sutton. We talked about that on the show. We liked him. We were debating between him and Boyd. And Boyd goes on the next pick, doesn't come back around to us in round 11. But then we see in round 11, Christian Kirk, DJ Chark, Curtis Samuel, Chris Olave, Jamison Williams. And again, we're going to do that for the final show of the week. But Colin, I do want to point out here that I mean, you're getting another very severe tear break right after round 10. Did you enjoy that clip? Make sure you hit that subscribe button to get more content from Rotoviz. And of course, you can check out full length podcasts at rotoviz.com forward slash podcast. Available on all podcast platforms. Check out our wide range of content. Once again, rotoviz.com forward slash podcast.